Welcome back to Worth the Effort Woodworking and a small series of videos that I'm calling the prerequisite course or kind of an introductory course to the craft that will explain some foundation you know, terminology, ideas and stuff like that so that you won't be as frustrated as you go down the path of picking up more knowledge from books, magazines or even YouTube videos. And the first video we worked on was basically discussing or understanding how all woodworking tools work and we used a chisel as an example. Today's episode we're going to talk about buying tools and once again because it was kind of the foundation we're going to use a chisel. So let's get busy. Now I am not intending this video to be a chisel comparison or review or me sitting there telling you you need to buy this brand for this reason, that kind of stuff. Uh, I'm just using chisels as kind of an example of the types of questions and research you need to do in order to get something that will actually work for you. I kind of find it funny that people spend so much time earning money and so little time researching how to spend it. And this is coming from a guy that sold motorcycles for uh, over a decade. Impulse buying huge dollars amount people are spending six seven months of their income on a whim and chisels compared to motorcycles and cars are not that expensive now if you are looking for a very detailed review I will say that just happenstance James Wright over on the wood by Wright channel he just finished up kind of an intensive analytical look at a lot of different types of chisel, uh, different brands of chisel, bench chisels. So if that's what you're looking for, go check that out. But today, I'm just going to look at some of the parameters you need to think about when you're buying a tool, and the chisel is going to be the uh, example. Now, in its most basic form, a chisel is just a chunk of steel that we put some kind of edge on it. But calling it a chunk of steel is really doing a disservice to the steel because steel is one of the greatest human inventions ever I mean what other device without changing any of its chemical properties can be be both hard and soft at the same time I mean the same hunk of metal could be both the lawnmower blade in your lawnmower and the tool you use to sharpen that. Think about that. In order to sharpen a lawnmower blade, the steel has to be harder than the lawnmower blade. Otherwise, the, the file that you're using would dull. So how do they do that? Well, I'm going to dramatically oversimplify this, but I think it's important because it affects the tools that you're going to be purchasing. So, steel is basically iron and carbon and some other chemicals. Uh, that you know you heat it red hot and you've seen it all in the movies you see the guy in the a blacksmith in the forge they pour some metal that's that mixture of iron carbon and yada 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 in in there then they heat it up they let it cool a little bit it's just so so it's hard enough that they can bang on an anvil they make a shape you know like a chisel or something like that and at that point in time if they were to let it cool down by radically quenching it. You know, in the movies you always see the blacksmith reach over and they drop it in a vat of water, where in real life it's probably a vat of oil and, you know, the oil will catch fire, flames will go up. They do it with water in the movies because, you know, actors and fire, not a really good mix with the insurance companies, so they use water there. But, you know, you drip something red hot into oil, quench it, and it quenches really tight and it turns into like a very crystalline structure. The chemical properties are the same. You still have your iron, your carbon, all those other stuff. They don't really change. They, they turn into the compound of steel, but the structure of the steel at the atomic level is very angular, very crystalline, and it's frozen up. Kind of like if you jump into an ice water uh, bath or something like that. Your whole body freezes up, tenses up. Same thing happens. How do you get untense? you warm up and you warm up somewhat gradually and that's what they do once you quench 
seize it up, you know, they basically forge these things just like this. Then they quench it and seize it, and that's what gives it that rock hardness. That's why this steel will cut other steels. Because the other steels, they soften it, and it's a process called annealing. And sometimes it's done over time. Sometimes it's done in molten states, like in salt or something like that. So they will let it cool down, then they'll re reheat it up to a certain temperature. Now, I know that when I make my plane blades for like this right, these right here, I will heat it red hot up in a, uh, with a blowtorch, quench it in peanut oil, and that gets it into that really hard state. And then I will put it in my toaster oven at about 300, 350 degrees for six or seven hours, and then let it slowly cool down from there. And just that little bit of baking softens the metal up. The key thing is, on tools, you don't want to soften it too much because if it's too soft, it won't hold an edge. But, if you don't soften it out enough, you will never be able to sharpen it because it'll be like a file. I mean, it just doesn't cut. Also, it'll be very brittle. This file right here, I cannot bend. If I were to take it and throw it on the concrete, it would more likely snap in half than bend. Whereas if you heat up this same exact file, maybe 450, 500 degrees, and let it slowly cool off, that's when you could start bending it. And that was the old Carney trick where you had those big strong men, they would bend steel. Well, basically they would soften the steel so it could be bent beforehand. Now, why is that important? Well, in chisels, you can have a variety of not only different steels, but different hardnesses of the steels depended upon how they were manufactured and how they were heat treated. And that could affect whether a chisel is so hard that it will hold whatever edge it can get for a long time, but it's really hard to get an edge. And some manufacturers will actually use that as a marking pitch. Here's a fairly common uh, brand out there. And right up front, they say it's 50% uh, 50% harder, 50% more resistant to dulling. Well, that just tells me that it's 50% sharp, uh, uh, takes 50% more power, time to sharpen it. And sharpening is one of those things that if it takes you more than 30 seconds to sharpen up your chisel after you've done the initial tuning where you flattened and polished the back or at least that little last inch so that all you really have to ever work is the front bevel, well, if it takes you more than 30 seconds, then more than likely you took a TikTok break in the middle of it. So, you know, sharpening, the ability to sharpen your tools, no matter what it is, is incredibly important. And if the process of manufacturing that tool makes it difficult to sharpen, you are not going to want to sharpen and you're not going to enjoy the tool as much. Then you have weird things like this right here. A uh you know, it's a file on both sides, and it's a chisel over here. It's an axe on one side. Four and one. Well, if you're buying a tool like this, even over the basic metallurgy I told you, you probably see the problem. Either the file is, either this is so hard that the file will work, and you will never be able to sharpen the, the chisel, or you're, this is soft enough you can put an edge on the chisel, and the filing will dull almost instantly. Strangely, I have heard that this is one of the best sellers in the market, but to me that's junk. Because of the little bit of research we've done on the metallurgy. Other things, the type of metal that they are using affects how you use it. Some of the common metals you'll hear talked about in the chisel realm are O1 tool steel. The O stands for oil quenching, so it's not water quench. And then A2 tool steel. Uh, which is a little bit more modern tool steel uh, that's a little bit harder, uh, so it holds its edge better. Uh, there are pluses and minuses of those. The general consensus is O1 tool steel will get a sharper edge, especially in the lower bevel angles. And when I say bevel angles, I mean that angle right there. Basically, the uh, most chisels are sharpened between 20 and 30 degrees. Probably most people are 25 to 30 degrees there. Below about 25 degrees, it is assumed that O1 tool steel will get a sharper, more durable edge. 
above 25 degrees, the edge that uh, the edge difference between the A2 and O1 is almost non-existent. But the A2 being the harder, more durable steel, the edge will last longer. So depending upon what you plan to do with your tools will affect which kind of steel you get. And I believe we are in a golden age of hand tools and machine tools because of metallurgy advances in this past decade or so. Uh, I got introduced to something called powdered metals uh, in the turning world and they were high speed steel tools that seemed to extend the edges life four or five six times over older high speed steels. Well that technology is now making its way into the steels we use here and uh, Veritas is kind of one of the first ones out of the gate with their PMV 11 steel. It's a powdered steel. The advantage of this one is it has the strength of and the hardness and durability of A2 tool steel and much harder steels than that but the sharpenability of O1 tool steel which is a little bit softer and that just first time I've experienced this it just blew my mind that the edge life of this tool was so long and yet it only took me my normal 30 seconds to resharpen, which I would have expected to take a lot longer as hard as that edge seems to be. The bad side of really hard edges is they don't roll to softness. They fracture off and that's something you can't really sharpen with normal stones. You have to go to the grinder. So if a, a tool is too hard, whether it being poorly produced or too hard to steel, then you're, you spend more time sharpening because you have to do grinding. My personal opinion, it's probably a little bit better to have too soft than too hard because you can always resharpen a too soft steel. But the other aspect of the type of steel you use and its heat treating is the function of how it dulls. It's really strange because again, this was the first nice chisel I bought and I used it for about a decade, not knowing any better. I thought this would serve my purposes great. When I started my school, I did a lot of research on chisels and I bought this one right here, which is a little bit higher carbon steel than that one. And what I found out was how it dulled was differently. Most chisels you will sharpen, some people will take it up to like 16,000 or 24,000 grit, which I think is way extreme because the first time you slide your chisel into your work, you start dulling it. And it's like it goes down, you know, 5, 10%. You hit that 90, 95% sharpness range. And in the ideal world, it will stay there for a long period of time and then go dull so that it's easy to use, it's safe to use, and then all of a sudden you realize, oh, now it's dull, I need to go sharpen it. Whereas the lesser quality steels, what I found out was that, that it dropped down sharpness, the 95, 90% range, and then the dulling was aver low, it was gradual. So what ended up is you went past the time that you were sharpening it, because you could accomplish the task just by pushing harder, leaning harder, things got more dangerous because when you're putting more pressure on, there's less more chances of slippage, errors, breakage, splitting, all that kind of stuff. A safe tool is a sharp tool. The most dangerous tool is a tool that has just passed its time point where it should have been sharpened, but you didn't sharpen it. And that's what you're getting with the higher quality steels you go is a maintained performance and then it telling you it's ready to be sharpened. Now beyond what steel you choose, some manufacturers add additives, more uh, molecules to the steel to affect performance and get different results. One of the big ones they do are the molecules they, they add to create stainless steel. To create stainless steel, uh, manufacturers add chemicals like chrome and vanadium or vanadium, I don't know how you pronounce it. Either way, 
Uh, it's additives to prevent corrosion so that they can put in water without rusting and stuff like that. A true high carbon O1 tool steel just sitting in the atmosphere will start to tarnish, start to turn black. That's why all of those old vintage tools were black. And the worst thing for a manufacturer would be to mass produce enough chisels for a few years of production life. They don't want to make a supply run that's only going to last a few weeks. They want to batch them out for a long period of time. But they don't want this thing to be sitting on a shelf and turning black like this one right here did over time because in comparison to other tools that might be sitting on a shelf that are nice and shiny a majority of consumers are going to buy the shiny not considering what steel it actually is in fact if it were to dull a little bit and tarnish a little bit that is an indication of some great steel that you might want to get but to gain that stainless steel aspect they do add different chemicals and that will give you different results. As I said, this this tool right here I used for 10 years without realizing I was missing out on anything. I only found out the advantages of some other tools for my specific purposes when I bought a bunch of different ones and tried them out. And I ended up getting this tool right here for my school because I loved the steel in it for my applications. Meaning something that would be in constant use and easy for students to resharpen. I meant it was probably a little bit softer, that's why I liked it. But if you are using a tool like this only occasionally, or maybe taking it out to a job site, working in the rain, working in the humidity, having sweaty hands on it, using it with gloves, this would have been a pretty poor choice because it's a little bit thinner, a little bit, bit, it wouldn't take as much abuse. Again, these are elements for your decision when you're buying stuff. You have to weigh the pros and cons of everything. And the other main material of your selection that you have to take into consideration is a handle material. You have a wide range. Uh, wide range. A lot of people love plastic uh, handles because they will take a huge amount of abuse and not really show anything. Again, I used this for about 10 years as my only chisel. You ba see barely anything. Whereas this chisel that I, sh uh, that I chose for the school, I didn't really like the material for the handle. Uh, it's a fairly soft metal. Uh, I picked this one out of the, the tool batch, school batch, simply because it still had the stickers on it and we could see that it was a chromium and magnesium magnesium additive but the one I used for about a year before making my decision you could see the end of it has totally mushroomed out it was a fairly soft wood that required a metal ring for me to use even with the light hits that I do with this thing this is not something thick enough for me to really get aggressive with mortising on uh, I have other chisels for that one this was a light use chisel and that's how much it mushroomed. But you select a harder wood, something like hornbeam or hard maple, or even nowadays you can use acrylic infused maples or even baked uh, torsion. I don't, I forget the term. This is baked metal uh, wood, so it actually changes its molecular structure to become much harder and much more durable. Well, that affects the use. And a lot of people like having wood over plastic because it's less slick if you're working all day long and your hands get sweaty and sticky and stuff like that. Because the wood will kind of absorb it and there's a texture there. Some people that work a lot in that kind of environment hate plastic handles because they'll actually encourage blistering and wear, wearing on your skin where woods don't. So even the material you use for the handles will affect the performance you have and the use and the enjoyment you'll have using the tool. Beyond material, now let's start talking about shape. This is a very popular brand out there, especially with construction sites. Look at it. Yes, we have the standard bevel right here, somewhere between 20 and 30 degrees. This is probably closer to 30, so it would take more abuse. But look at it. It's 
fairly thick and the bolsters on the side are just massive meaning that there's a lot more metal here so this is something that could go into a mortise and be wrenched out or if you you're clearing out uh half laps like in a construction site on two by twelves after you cut them with a um with a circular saw this could be used with a claw hammer metal back out there it could take a lot of abuse high chromium aspect to it and if you remember this is the one that was 50 percent harder so it could just take a lot of hits and maybe not change its shape as much but it would be much more difficult to sharpen but this might not need to be as sharp as something i'm using to uh, carve bevels or cut out dovetails or joinery aspect so maybe sharpen it just straight off a grinder and never worry about it so this shape worked great for them because of the strength but that is a huge wing. That's actually a disadvantage if you're cutting stuff like dovetails or fine joinery. Because sliding that into the corner of your work means that the corner is going to be squared off. Whenever vintage woodworkers designed their tools, they wanted a very thin shoulder that was even all the way back so that they could fit into fine corners of their joinery and slide in without the taper raising up that joint. So having something that progressed from thin to thick created a triangle aspect that just wasn't going to work for really fine woodworking. Which is one of the reasons why I loved this chisel for my school. Not only was a steel appropriate for my application, but the shape being very thin and very even all the way down was really nice for the type of woodworking I was teaching. Look at the one I used for a decade. High bolsters and you can tell all my work from that time period because all my dovetails had a little square on the very bottom corner caused by this chisel right here because half inch is the main one I use. Now true high-end luxury tools you know like the ferraris and bogatis of chisels well look at that bolster can you even see it because it is non-existent that is actually what when i first sharpened it and i did a little work on the back uh, polishing it that became a cutting edge and i actually had to take sandpaper along here to dull it so that as i slid into some of my joints i wasn't cutting my fingers that's how sharp that edge was and that is a tool designed for a very specific purpose but if I was doing more timber framing work or heavy ch uh, mallet work this would not have been as good a tool because look at how thin it is all the way across I can actually feel a little flexing when I put pressure on it not so much with the one with the tool I replaced definitely not with this one shape also extends beyond the the blade uh, to the handle i mean do you want something that will likely roll on your workbench or do you want something that's going to stay fairly flat the nut doesn't roll very much at all because it's squared off octagonal uh, other things um, Thumb placement, something like this right here. Even something as simple as that little cutout right there for you to register where flat is on your chisel makes a world of difference, especially if you're wearing gloves while you work for an uh, out construction site. That makes a difference. Uh, placement for your fingers. You know, one of the reasons why this style of chisel became so popular in the 70s and 80s because you could do so much with it. You could do fine work choking up on it you could push it in your palm you could grip it at a bunch of different angles something you can't really do if you need a uh, ferrule on the back to prevent it from mulling over that's not as comfortable place the size of the handles you know these right here great for pushing with your palm to do fine work not so great if you are holding it to hold, needing to hold it to hit a mallet because you got a pinch point right here. Uh, handle size, uh, design-wise, I will tell you, this right here 
is um, well, a good time to cover it. Uh, this right here is a socket style. The handle is actually designed to separate. You bang it, 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 it locks in there because of the taper, but you tap it and it'll come out. Uh, I, I would say I'm a bit of an odd duck right there. I do not like this design. The only reason I keep this around was just to, for demonstration purposes. Uh, you can't hang these because in the middle of the night you will come out to a clanging action as all these pop out because the temperature changes on that kind of stuff. The advantage people have of these is the handles are really easy to make. So if you abuse these or break your handles quite often, you can make a new one really, really quickly. And some people like to have multiple different sizes of handles for different applications. Once again, this size handle fits in your hand very nicely though I have, I have small hands so if I were to make one in that kind of action maybe I would make it a little bit shorter if you're pairing work it's nice to have a longer handle so you can get some leverage in there so this is easy way to replace handles but you know I always uh, see people that are using this style hand style chisel and you know you ask them how many handles do you have uh, general answer is well one so you know I think it's kind of defeats a purpose I personally like a tanged handle and they say it's harder to make these styles of handle because you have a piece of metal that goes down in here to anchor it so you drill a hole you get a ferrule and then you drive that in there it presses that wood out against a ferrule and that's what locks it in there so this is not coming out until you destroy the handle they say that's more complicated to make but I say I'm a woodworker I can make one and if I'm not having to replace it as often no big deal to me so that's another aspect of handles but shape wise you know how you use a handle would how you use a chisel we de determine how you uh, what shape you like i love this one because i use these chisels quite a bit like this and like that grip wise so it just fits my hand really nicely whereas i never really like these handles very much because they are a little bit thick for me and I could never get comfortable using it even though the blade was thin with a narrow shank so it was designed to be used in hand this back side never appealed to me now continuing with the idea of shape dimensions and this might be one of the rarest instances where us Americans were actually put on the back burner as far as what is actually produced now I'm a big fan of the metric system don't get me wrong for big distances i think the decimal way the metric system is done is better but for human scale stuff and the way i build stuff with a lot of relative measurements i just like the fact that the imperial system is fraction based one half inch one quarter one eight sixteen sixty fourth sections of sections of sections it just works better it's not the actual measurement i like it's the division I like. I think it works better for human scale. As such, I wanted imperial tools so that a half inch chisel matches the half inch router bit, matches the half inch ruler so that I can do stuff like when I'm putting a, uh, a half inch, um, excuse me, a quarter inch mortise on a three quarter inch board, you basically take the chisel you rotate it over one time, a quarter inch chisel, that will find the center of a three quarter inch board. You rock this off. You're making a half inch line. Well, there I go. I bump it up against there. I can measure stuff. I can use these consistently throughout all my work. But in chisel wise, most things out there are made on the metric system with approximations of imperial measurements. For example, that chisel I used for 10 years, it is 12 millimeters, and they label that as a half inch. But in reality, not so much. Same, I mean, it's across the board. They're just kind of approximations of the imperial side, which is one reason why I chose this one for my school, because... This was a special production run uh, made for Lee Valley from this company, other brand, which were true imperial measurements. 
They were not metric whatsoever, which I really did like. That works for the way I build, but I wouldn't have known that unless I'd done the research and found a company where their half inch is really a half inch, not 12 millimeters. Now this is a lot of information. It's a lot of research, but it's not overly hard to find research. You can find a lot of it when they are on the advertisements. You can find some of it in forums and just research and stuff like that. I'm willing to bet if you spent an hour, hour and a half doing a little bit of this research, you would have found out most of this information on a specific chisel or stuff like that. So maybe a place to start is look at you know other YouTube videos, see what equipment they are using, and then begin your research there. But I would not take that, hey, Sean Graham uses this chisel, this is the one I buy. Because it might not be the right solution for you. And if you get in this habit of doing research before you purchase stuff, you'll make wise decisions and you won't be scammed with something that looks like a great buy to the casual, but it's a piece of junk that you can't resell to anybody. And this isn't saying buy anything expensive, because once again, uh, I want to say these right here are still selling, you know, less than 20 bucks. The ones I got for my school started, I think, $12. Uh, you buy a set of four or just get one half inch, which is what I always recommend, and go from there. Me, myself, you know, here's the set I use all the time. And I am slowly, every few years, I think I bought this one five years ago. And then I got a one inch version three years ago. And I will build up to a nice collection of those as I can, but I'm not in a hurry because I have a foundation set that I use, using mainly the half incher. Now, I do want to put a, a warning out there on research, and I don't think this is unique to woodworking, but it did get me at one time. Let's talk about this chisel I used for a decade. When I bought this chisel, I was buying a Marples Blue Chip Chisel. Irwin had just bought a company called Marples, and through, I want to say the late 70s or 80s, they made one of the best uh, thought of chisels on the market. It was an incredibly high carbon steel blade, didn't have a lot of vandium or that kind of stuff in it. The shaping was just perfect with that low bevel. It was a, it was a fine woodworker's dream because it was a dirt cheap chisel with all the features we loved on it. And it got great reviews in magazines and stuff like that. And you can tell them the true Marples ones because the blue hand, it was a little bit different color of blue handle and it had silver Marples right there. And they called them Marples Blue Chips. That name had such a good reputation back then that to this day, Irwin still labels their chisels Marples Blue Chips. Um, when Irwin took over them, you know, they changed the color to a slightly different shade of blue just to match their corporate things. And they changed the shape and metal properties of the steel. Still a perfectly fine chisel. Again, I used it for a decade not knowing what I was missing. But I based a lot of my initial impressions of feeling good that I made a good purchase on the idea that I was buying the original Marples Blue Chips. So my warning is about generational progress. Things don't say the same in these modern day world, especially in the tool market. Companies get bought out, they, uh, manufacturing changes plants or changes from one country to the other. Uh, this was a perfect example. In fact, nowadays, a lot of people look for these on the used market compared to what the newer ones are because they like the handle shape better. Marples change the design of the shape of the handle it has a little thumb thing right there it's a little bit flatter on back a little bit thicker square that kind of stuff uh, and people are prefer these but it's also one of those things that if i had known back then what i know now i would have searched for some off brands because the original marples plant company was still making that same high quality chisel but they were making them for like off name brand stuff. You know, some had green handles, you know, pink, 
just all kinds of stuff for little companies out there that wanted their own branded chisels. It was just rebrand, uh, what are they, re rebranding or repackaging or something like that. So they were still out there for a little while that I could have bought when I bought this one. So, and that is true across the board, power tools, that kind of stuff. I, I do know that when I first started uh, uh, manufacturing, you know, everyone thought poorly of Craftsman brand because they were, weren't making great things. But they had one bandsaw model that was a rebranding of a couple of higher end models. Just had a different motor, a third horsepower motor instead of a half horsepower motor. And I did do research on that one. And I used that 10 inch saw for five or six years before upgrading to a 14 incher. And I, I wish I'd kept it. It was a great saw with a crappy brand name for the time. So. I want you to be careful when you're doing research, especially if you're looking for past models or models that were three, four, five years old back. You might find uh, articles that say great things about them, but you just got to be wary in the modern day. And that's the same with cars. I mean, manufacturers change, get bought out, stuff like that. Quality changes from cars from one year to the next, even with the same model. So you just got to do your research. And research is going to be your homework before the next episode. I want you to pick one woodworking tool. I don't really care what it is. It could be a power tool. It could be a hand tool. It could be a hydraulic tool. Again, I don't care. But I want you to give me one sentence describing what you would use that tool for. Example, I do not have a draw knife. I would love to get a good quality draw knife. My sentence would be, I want to use a draw knife at my workbench to rough out green lumber, green blanks, for spoon making. That's a specific use at a location, and that would describe a lot of features I want to do. Below that one sentence, just give me five bullet points or highlights or something like that of elements of design you're looking for in that tool. This might mean you need to do some research on a couple of different brands to figure out the differences and what people like and don't like and just pick the best of them. You don't have to pick a specific brand or model to recommend. Just give me five descriptive elements that you think would make a good quality tool. Now if you can't think of any tool in the prompt down below in the description I'll give you a, a a list of a bunch of random tools that you might not have heard of and give you a chance to do some research on maybe a purchase decision you'll make in the future. No matter what, it will give you a chance to explore searching for woodworking tool information. So, before you watch the next video, I want you to do that one. Leave it in the description down below. And it might be information that other people would benefit from. Well, I hope you enjoyed this. Remember, it's always worth the effort to learn create stuff, and share it with others. Be safe. Have fun.